What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. The final, final little pass is a business. Dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, your horror safe haven. I'm Gail Weathers. And I'm Deputy Riley. And we're broadcasting, not live, but from Stu Mocker's house. <laughs> but actually, though, we're in Stu's living room. Yeah, we are. We're at the Scream house. We're in the fucking house from Scream, dude. Yeah. The house where the whole second hour of Scream takes place. And the house that will be in the new one, too. We saw it in the trailer. That's right. It's in the trailer. Yeah. We're going back to Stu's house. What the <laughs> fuck? That's weird. Yeah. That guy's dead. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Now you gotta die. Those are the rules. Yeah. This was a very cool thing done for us by Paramount. They asked us if we wanted to go to Stu's house. And we said, absolutely. So yes, we're please. spending the night here. And it's just been all like all day, just scream stuff all day. And it's just the two of us here. Yeah, we have the house to ourselves. They basically, house. we're just like, have fun. Nobody else is here. Except us chicken. <laughs> bark, bark, bark. There's also no one else around. This house is in the middle of fucking nowhere. It dude. is. You can hear. I remember we were filming something outside earlier. You could hear the cows. Yeah. Yeah. A giant fucking hawk or we something saw a giant flew hawk. around. We saw some deer run by. Oh, yeah. It's great. Yeah. I love it. This house is in like farmland. And also the layout of the house hasn't changed since 26 years ago when they filmed this here. Everything is the same. And Paramount restaged some of the furniture and stuff, uh, the decor of the house to be similar to what it was in the first movie. So this yeah, is awesome. So if you're watching the video version of the podcast, James is sitting right where Jamie Kennedy stands in the first movie to, to tell everyone the rules of horror movies. Yeah, dude. Like I am in the spot where Jamie Kennedy did uh, one take of it. And Wes Craven was like, good, we got it, moving on. And then Jamie Kennedy was like, actually, Wes, I'm really sorry. Uh, can we do another one for me? And Wes was like, no, we're good. And Jamie was like, please. And he let him do it a second take and a third. And they ended up using the second and third take. And Wes told Jamie, that was great. Never feel uh, too afraid to ask a director to do another take. That's what Jamie Kennedy said in an oh, interview. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and they ended up you he was right. That actor instinct. Yeah, right. Of like, no, I can I can do better. I can do it better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I mean this house, parts of it look the same. Like the kitchen is the craziest thing, I mm -hmm. think. That's the thing. I mean, we first walked in and it's just the kitchen is right there. And I think that I think that room kind of freaks me out the most because well, it looks yeah, that's the scariest scene. It is too. the scariest scene, yeah. And we actually did a video earlier today going around the whole house and explaining the layout of the house, where they filmed what, what little cheats they did mm -hmm. as far as the layout goes. Surprisingly, they stuck to the layout of the house almost entirely. Yeah, we were kind of amazed because often in movies you'll you know if they're filming in like in a house often they'll cut to another room and it's like a set or a set or another or they location just, yeah because uh sydney and billy have sex in Stu's room or Stu's parents room or something and we we're like that might be a different no that's upstairs. that's upstairs the whole chase scene happens upstairs like it's nuts they use this house it's yeah awesome it's very very cool like very few things were cheated uh we will tell you what was in our video yeah that won't be out until january to help promote scream five or i'm sorry scream mm -hmm. uh <laughs> but w what i would like to say is that we are not paid to be here or to make either of those videos no. paramount did fly us up here and put us up in this house for the night but they they gave us two options they were like all right so you can ask for a rate and we'll pay you uh, but then you got to run by whatever you film uh by us and we'll let you know what you can and can't post or you can just come up there and film whatever you want and post it and we won't say it like anything. And we we're like, yeah, that one. Yeah. And that was like, we we won't pay you, but you guys can just do whatever you want. Exactly. So, like, so you know, they one, fed please. us, which is great. Yeah. And put us up here, but we're not being paid. No, this was mostly for us. <laughs> like yeah. This was just a fun thing for us. To being do. here is, is payment enough because Scream is uh, one of the most important horror movies in my life. I know Night of the Living Dead I probably saw earlier at a younger age, but Scream is the one that I think made me a horror fan because the first time it was put on in my family home, I was too scared, ran away from it because of that opening scene. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, when I was finally brave enough to watch the whole thing, I think that's when I became a horror fan. What's your favorite scary movie? 
Oh, come on. You know I don't watch that shit. I feel like a lot of people our age scream as the formative I mean, it revitalized movie. the horror genre. Yeah. We talk about it all the time, so I don't want to harp on something that we're always yeah, talking about. Yeah, we talk about. about it a lot in our movies that changed horror podcasts. That's like an older episode, but... Still very that. good and informative. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, the reason Scream uh, set a template for, you know, half a decade after it was just because it was so successful and so hip and felt fresh and of the time. It wasn't a sequel to a franchise that started in the 80s. It wasn't something cheesy or corny. It was it was uh, well-known actors. The casts of these movies is insane. And it was funny, but it was still scary. Like, I just fucking love Scream. And we just watched all four of them. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, in anticipation of Scream 5 and coming here and doing this. And we introduced some friends to it who had never seen the movies. That was a lot of fun that was watching so much it with fun. friends who... Who didn't know the killers. Who did it, yeah, watching the original Scream with some friends who didn't know how the first one ended was very fun. Yeah, yeah. lots of fun. Uh, they rarely were able to guess the correct killer. Sometimes to they were To be fair, the to. movie doesn't give you a lot to go off of. No. And like none of the movies do. It's a crap the shoot, killer yeah. is always like it's cuz I was your half brother. Like you're oh never going to just yeah. you're never going to piece that together on your own. That's an introduced element that is like, "Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I see." But that's why today we're going to be talking about just the franchise as a whole. We'll go through each movie. At the end we'll give a little ranking, which I'm sure will be difficult. Yeah, cuz right now do. my ranking is 1 and then all the sequels. Like I don't yeah. know what order to put the sequels in. That's actually how I feel too. I know that for a long time I professed a deep burning hatred for Scream 3. After this rewatch, man, I had a fun time watching it. It's got such stupid things in it. It has problems. It has major fucking problems. But was I entertained? Yeah. Yeah. I really was. And so uh, I'm excited to dig into each movie with you, Ms. Weathers. Yeah. <laughs> and uh My yeah, lime I think green suit. I I can't believe our I can't assistant believe. Ben was able to find yeah, thank something you, ben, that close. Yeah, for finding the suit. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say just the franchise as a whole is very watchable, very entertaining. Yeah, I find it cozy. Like there's something about it that I could just have it on in the background and I just find it very I don't know what I think maybe it's a fuzzy nostalgia thing mm-hmm. because it reminds me of being, yeah, I mean, you know, we were both are alive for the night and have like memories of it you know we weren't like super super young Mm -hmm. like we remember the time that these movies were made yeah those first two feel like little 90s time capsules yeah and it's like that age too where it's like you know because we're young in the 90s like like old enough to remember it but young enough to where it still feels like a idyllic kind of yeah childhood time so that's probably something to do with it too yeah and i've said before that my favorite franchises i've named them as like uh nightmare saw and child's play and chucky mm-hmm. uh i i never included scream just because it didn't feel like it had enough movies to be included and sure. because I thought that I hated Scream 3 more than I do. But after having rewatched them, Scream is right up there with any of those. Yeah, they're watchable. We keep saying they're watchable, but that's the best word I can think of to describe them. Whereas other franchises like Friday the 13th, I'm like, <laughs> this is, I'm not having a fun time watching this. There's bad decisions made and also I'm not entertained by it. Whereas the Scream sequels, there are choices made, but I'm still having having a fun time with them. And I think it just helps because the characters in Scream are so good that even when a Scream movie is not the best, you still have really good stuff with the main three. Like oh they're always God. really good every movie. Those three are three of my favorite I know, movie characters they're... ever. They're so fantastic. I mean, Sydney Prescott is my favorite final girl. Mm-hmm. Heather, I love you. And I love Nancy. Uh, Sydney just edges out. Nancy because the other Wes Craven yeah I know rest in peace man yeah but Sydney is just such a fighter and then in the third movie she's given back by helping on the crisis hotline yeah and you just get to learn so much about her like she's does a play in college and then in the fourth movie you find out she also did theater in high school like she was in a Peter Pan production yeah there's it's weird how the Wes Craven final girls like her and Nancy both have this thing where in movies that they come back in they serve as a way to give back to other characters like Nancy is a grad student and studies like sleep and comes back to like help these kids yeah there's something like so resilient about them that they like want to come back and revisit all this really fucked up shit 
to like help other people get through that stuff. And I love that. I love that about Wes Craven's Final Girl so much. That's- and Nev is just so fucking strong and powerful. Yeah, and just without really shows being that- a caricature either. Yeah, she's very vulnerable, but you can watch her fight through it and fight through her fear in real time. Her her face acting is so good. Yeah, she's like a she she's like a literal, you know, like the idea of like strong female characters. Sometimes veers into territory where it's like it feels like almost a joke, you know? It's mm-hmm. like let's just make this woman like so tough that it feels like you're almost mocking this character a little <laughs> bit, but no, Sydney is like so strong but realistic, you know? Like I feel she she feels like watching a character where I'm like, you know what? Maybe if I were in a situation like this, I would have the, you know, this this crazy inner strength. I had no idea. That's what she feels like to me. Is she feels like a character who's realizing like, oh, when something calls for it, I can kick ass. You know, it feels very natural and doesn't feel like wait this character randomly knows how to do like this 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 like no it just feels very innate to her and like real she just feels like a survivor you know the growth is there too because i mean even in the first one she's fighting back but she's also running but then that fourth one you know they watch the friend get killed in the neighboring house and she'd like just fucking without even thinking runs over there to try to do something about it yeah that's it's weird like in our i'm gonna name drop but in our interview with john carpenter we <laughs> we talked about um how Lord Lori is kind of like this everyman character because she's a babysitter. And, you know, if you're a babysitter, you're doing it because you're probably like working class and you need some some cash and babysit for some kids down the street. And I think that's something that I feel like that's an ingredient of a final girl that maybe we don't talk about enough is the idea that like final girls are kind of everyman characters. Like there's something they feel so attainable almost. And they feel, you know, you have to have that amount of vulnerability for them to be interesting to follow around for a whole movie because if they're like invincible and you're not scared for them then you don't have much of a horror movie and i'm very scared i'm scared for sydney Sydney every movie i'm scared for for this new one dude radio silence if you kill sydney prescott we we're breaking up with you (laughs) yeah we love you guys but if you kill sydney prescott after everything she's fucking been through she's been through so much she's been through so fucking much and if you fucking put a knife in her chest again and this time, do it for real and kill her. Oh, my God. She doesn't deserve it. They have to kill someone. They have to it's kill. It's going to suck so They're going to kill one of the big three, It's going to suck so much. Because that was the thing with four. Four came back after an 11-year gap, and there were ample opportunities. Courtney Cox could have been killed in the barn. Yeah. She wasn't. Sydney could have been killed in the end. She wasn't. People uh, complain that those things didn't happen, and I understand those complaints. Maybe they should have. I love the characters I so, love much them so much <laughs> that I'm glad we get them for another movie. Yeah. But if one of them has to go, that'll add a lot of drama and I'll be heartbroken. Yeah. You know, uh, because let's talk about Gail, who yeah. you're dressed as. Gail is such a good character. And she's one of those characters who, when I'm young watching it, I'm like, she's mean. She's a bitch. And she is. She but is. Yeah. She's so fucking but good she's, at that. She's, <laughs> she's an example of... <sighs> Maybe not the best example, but when I think of Gail, because at her core, she's a protagonist, right? Like at her core, she, you know, she ends up being a good guy. Like you would never say Gail is like a villain or, you know, she's an anti-hero, I would say. Anti-hero, yes. But I think when it comes down to it, her the core of her character is she's always going to do the right thing. Because you're never, you know, she never Uh. has... I don't know, but she ends up, I don't know. Like, what are you thinking? I mean, uh, she's, here's the thing. Is she? <sighs> her arc is great. By by Scream 4, she is a good person, I would that's say. That's what I mean. Is yeah. it, and that's what I mean about, I think, I think her, the core of her leans towards good because she does develop so much. And she, in terms of like demeanor and the way that she is, she's the example, she's the perfect example, like I was saying, of nice being different than good kind of thing, which to quote into the woods, but she's not very nice, she's not. <laughs> but she is ultimately a good character, a okay. good person. Sure. Granted, it takes her a while to get there and she is like an entertainment journalist and does some um, maybe not quite ethical things. She gives a college lecture in the, is it the second one? Third. Or third one where she's like, do what you got to do to get your story. Fuck, <laughs> uh, fuck friends, like fuck all the haters kind of lecture at this 
university <laughs> and all the students are like, dude, <laughs> um, how do you sleep at night, Gail? <laughs> Stop at nothing. Be willing to have the world hate you because that is the only way that you'll get the story, the facts, and the fame. But that's why, I don't know, that's why I love Gail. I love that she is a character that, like, I don't know, you, everyone loves Gail. Who doesn't love Gail? I think plenty of people probably don't love Gail. Well, but, they're wrong. Well, I mean, she's a nasty, she's a nasty woman. In those she, first... She's a very nasty woman. But she's like, <laughs> I don't know, You, I, I noticed this when we were watching him this time. Like, you don't often get to see female characters be so borderline, you know? Yeah. Like, she's unlikable at so many points in these movies, but you still, she's written for you to ultimately care about, like, women often aren't given the room to behave like that because like a Walter White you yeah, know and she's not that bad she's no, not murdering yeah, people yeah exactly she's saving people from being murdered yeah and people still love Walter White yeah or, or, you know a less extreme example Don Draper plenty yeah. of people love him I mean I love Don Draper yeah. he's, As a, he's a piece there, of shit there's such fucking good characters and Gail is I'm out of the three, like, I love them all. She might be the most interesting character. I think she kind of is. I think just because she's such, like, a morally weird character, and, like, I think she changes the most yes. out of all the characters. Mm -hmm. Gail is an example of a strong female character also, and I don't mean that in, like, that she's strong and, and kicks ass. Like, no, she's just, she's strong in that the way she's, she has so many layers to her, and she's very gray area and interesting and complicated, and that's really cool. She just feels very human. She's very ambitious. She knows what she wants, and, uh, you know, as you said, she says that, you should do anything you need to to achieve it. And then we see in the fourth one how uh, when that sex, when that success isn't sustained, how much it weighs on her and like mm -hmm. the jealousy she has of Sydney for having a successful book when she's unable yeah. to write anything. Like, I just love seeing that. And I'm, I'm so curious to see where these characters are in their lives now because you know that that the first three movies work as a nice little trilogy back to back to back pretty much yeah and then scream four is a really fun time to check in on these people at a different stage in their lives 11 years is so long God, you saying that about gail made me realize that like something cool about that fourth one is the idea of female jealousy it's, it's her niece right is the is ghost face sydney's or it's her cousin sydney's cousin jill yes. yeah so sydney's cousin who is also very jealous of her right yeah. her whole yeah. thing is she's jealous of her she had to grow up hearing all about Sydney and she wants to be the center of attention. Even now. even Jill's mom is like, no one ever asks me about my yeah, star. About so me. yeah, there's yeah. So there's that. just this like women being jealous of Sydney thing. Mm -hmm. And I think now that you pointed out, I love the difference between Jill and Gail, where Jill is jealous of Sydney and obviously is the villain of the movie for it. But you also in the beginning you're introduced again to Gail and her whole crux, like her whole thing in this movie is she's jealous of Sydney because. Sydney has this book career that Gail doesn't have, and ultimately Gail prioritizes her friend Sydney over her book. You know, well, yeah, because she's she's jealous of her, but they're still friends. She still loves her. When they first see each other at the bookstore, when Sydney's there for the book signing, they hug, and it's a really nice moment too. Because the other thing about the Scream series that's so great is the little callbacks and mirrorings yeah. of all the little moments, and so that moment when they just like embrace without hesitation is such a nice contrast to is it in three when uh sydney shows up at the police station and gail's there and they have this kind of awkward like are we friends yeah or have we just been through some shit together we'll hug but i By guess the fourth one it's like even if we don't talk for a while we're still like found family forever yeah. kind of thing and instead of acting on that resentment like uh jill does what Gail does instead is she's like, okay, this writing a book thing isn't working out for me. I'll do what I'm good at and solve this murder yeah. and like takes it into her own hands. Oh, I love Gail. I love Gail. I love and Gail. She, I wish she wasn't kind of MIA for like the last half of that movie though. Cause she kind of like, yeah, after the barn, she's yeah, just in the hospital. That's she's That's my gone. big issue with that one. Well, that's a issue I also have with three is the first half. Sydney's not really around, you know, when she's like, mm. uh, she's just doing her fucking dead mom hallucination shit, oh, which is awful. That's not good. So it takes her half the movie to get into the plot, really. So yeah, just like, like we said, all the sequels have weird things. About yeah, them. just cry face and like dead mom hallucinations, mm -hmm. which yeah, Nev Campbell's cry face, though. And then there's Dewey. Oh, yeah. And there's Dewey, who's just a sweet boy. Yeah. And I remember when I covered Scream, 
Because uh, when we watched these movies recently, all four of them, it was the first time I had watched them since 2017 when I first covered them on The Kill Count. And, you know, back then I've talked about how, like, uh, I would say I had a bit more cynicism and like, oh, I fucking hate Scream 3. I, I constantly made fun of Dewey and, like, easy to do. He's a weird fucking guy. Yeah, yeah. But I thought, it, I thought he was, like, dumb weird. He is so endearing. David Arquette's decisions playing that character. They're just so good are fucking phenomenal and they're just like they're they're his little face i don't even know what he's doing but i love it and it's so true to the character he's just like too good for his own good and yet he's also a good cop that's what i love about dewey he's a fucking goofy guy and he is you know so innocent that it's easy to make fun of him and gail does all the time uh because yeah he he just seems so happy-go-lucky but at the same time he is an effective cop in scream 3 he talks about how someone was trying to break into where sydney's files were so he removed her files before it was broken into successfully like he does these little things and that's why sydney looks up to him and admires him so much their relationship is just, I love their relationship. It's so good because, you know, Dewey's sister Tatum was Sydney's best friend, killed in the first movie. And she becomes a kind of surrogate sister mm-hmm. to him. And she reciprocates that kind of sibling love when she sees him in Scream 2 because they're in college in Ohio. So he's had to travel from California to Ohio just to check in on her. Immediate just loves him, loves yeah. that he's there. And in all the movies, they're so happy to see each other and protect each other. She she has his number. He's the only person she has on her speed dial in mm-hmm. Scream 3. I think Dewey's a kind of male character that you don't get to see very often. Any other movie, he would be kind of comedic relief and certainly wouldn't be like the lead romantic story of a movie, you know, because he's just such a goofball. It mm-hmm. would be, I don't know, he just is such a an interesting because he's so sensitive he's very sensitive and i love that he has that character trait where he'll like build up a big sentence with lo- like big words and just this run-on sentence and just like deliver it as a punch and to try to impress someone and it kind of works because it comes out of nowhere and like he runs out of breath by the end of the sentence but he does that frequently so it's like again it's true to the character yeah oh man i love him dewey is also probably the funniest character consistently he's in that so first funny. movie dude when he's still living at home like the rookie deputy mom says you have to respect me as a man of the law when i'm wearing this badge like he's so fu- he's eating ice cream while his boss the sheriff <laughs> Smoking, is smoking a yeah. cigarette. He like misses putting on his sunglasses. He <laughs> It's so good. And it's like so I don't know, it's so genuine. Like I think it's genuinely hard to play that stuff and make it seem like really cute and instead of like this is a slapstick, you know. Yeah. Um, like it feels like a real person. I feel like so many other actors would play that as like purposely kind of, you know, clowny. Well, in Scream 4, Dewey becomes sheriff and he has Deputy Hicks. And I think she is meant to be similar to him in her behavior. And I don't mind her. She's going to be in the new one. I'm Mm. interested to see what happens with her there. But I think our friend Gressel said it best when he was like, what David Arquette does effortlessly, you can kind of see that actress making those choices you can see the seams of her like trying to be that character whereas with dewey you just believe that that's how that guy is yeah it's i totally agree and i'm i'm curious to see where that character goes because i just love i just love gail and dewey so much that i'm just like who is this you (laughs) get away from him (laughs) yeah no i'm team gail that entire movie i mean i think you're supposed to be (laughs) whatever i mean you don't like i wouldn't want to be in gail's way are you kidding me dear god no (laughs) yeah like we also we watch you on netflix and i'm like (laughs) gail would be someone i would be like don't get don't start looking at her man the wrong way because she's this close to being able to do an elaborate murder. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I guess we can talk about each movie. Okay. Uh, Scream, it's hard for me. I to- mean, if, like if we just talk about Scream the first, we're going to be here forever. Yeah. So I think we're going to have to truncate our original Scream discussion I- with the knowledge that we've talked about it a lot in various yeah. forms on this channel. Before. Yeah. It's one of my favorite. It's probably number two after the thing. Um, I love that opening scene is one of the greatest. It's still fucking scary. It's very scary. Like watching it with our friends. One of our friends was like, that opening scene is genuinely upsetting. Yeah, it <laughs> fucked her up. Like it's it's scary. It's the most serious 
uh, scene in the movie. Well, maybe not. It might be. It's up there. I mean, in terms of like tone, mm-hmm. like there's definitely serious subject matter in Scream, but like as far as an extended sequence where the mood is like just scary and really dark, it's got to be that. But especially the parents coming home and parents coming home, hearing her on the phone after she's yes, been stabbed. Yeah, it's so scary. Yeah, and Wes Craven does a lot of canted angles in that first movie, and it really just throws you off kilter like it's supposed to like uh when jamie's on the couch and Ghostface to come behind him it gets real canted but that scene when both parents get on the phone it kind of tilts and you just feel like their world falling apart yeah and, and then you see drew barrymore being dragged away with the phone in her hand the lead group of characters in scream never matched again no, no offense never. to the rest of the cast never gonna... but it's like peak 90s just vibes i don't know how else to describe it yeah ski Ulrich at his greasiest very greasy yeah matthew lillard at his most ridiculous like the, how does he get away with this character i don't know because that's the thing scream 2 timothy oliphant kind of does what matthew He's... lillard does and it doesn't work as well for me because matthew lillard is fucking spitting at some point he's drooling all over the place talking about like you got a sequel and he's just <laughs> drooling every, it's like dripping off his chin and he's just he's so tall he's just so yeah, like, he's just, like <laughs> he's just such a presence and is like up here constantly just i think probably it probably works because he has ski or like he like th- those two playing off each other but granted you don't realize they are kind of playing off each other until the end of the movie. Well, that no, they're, they're kind of like a duo. even in the video store, they're doing a bit of a bromance thing. Even at the fountain in the beginning, yeah, they're like yeah, they're, they're trading barbs of like yeah, accusing each other kind of fake. Right. Yeah, it's great. I don't know. I just think of his performance and I'm like, how did he get away? How did, how does everyone love this? It's kind of <laughs> insane that everyone is like, yes, this is great. Because I don't think I ever hear people being like, oh man, that character's so fucking annoying. I think some people would say that. But I would disagree but with them. Matthew Lillard's a national treasure. That's true. This is true. <laughs> and so is Skeet Ulrich. <laughs> <laughs> I want to meet them so bad. I know. The reveal of the killers is fantastic. Yes. And their motive is real good. And it feels like such a good tie-in to the feeling of the opening of the movie. Because like we said, the scene in the kitchen is also fucking terrifying. Like as... I don't know. Like it, it balances terrifying with funny so fucking well. That's also something I like about Scream because yes. I'm I'm very uh, iffy on horror comedy, like we've discussed on this show. But Scream is so funny while also being a horror. Like it's primarily a horror movie. The scene in the kitchen where there is very funny stuff happening, like the like your mom was no share and stuff. It's like. <laughs> Like that, yes, that's that's such a funny line in his little, but it, like the context is like, fuck, it's dark as shit. Yeah, you can laugh at the over the top performance that Matthew Lillard is giving, but the second you put yourself in Sydney's shoes, it's so, yeah, you're terrified. And just what he's talking about is like these two like raped and killed her mom. Yeah. And they're just making all these like, oh, jokey jokes. Yeah, it's but you're not sick. a virgin anymore. So you got, yeah, it's like, it's so fucked. Yep, guy, guy, that's the rules. Yeah. Like it's, it's both hilarious and terrifying so good there's something about like the perfect horror villain being like a like being able to nail being terrifying and over the top i mean it's what freddy does in the first in like one and three you know he's making jokes but he's doing it in a mean way that makes it scary yeah i think that's why people are really drawn to the joker because the joker is a character that is the embodiment of that Mm -hmm. the joker is over the top and scary i think it's also scary because you have like these little funny bits with matthew lillard in the background you have skeet arch just like ripping up a couch yeah. and he's like you bitch like he's like he's just full-on rage it's fucking scary you're right that the having a billy there really works the two of them are just I, you need them both. and then and then you have like just their physicality yeah. you know the the popular theory that they love each other, and that's like that, that's why you think it's Stu who killed Tatum. Dude, the way Matthew Lillard looks at Skeet Orch's neck, where he's like, they're cute. And uh, in this movie, as with all of the first four, I believe, Marco Beltrami's score, I really love the music in it. The uh, Not only the incidental music, but also the needle drop of Red Right Hand mm-hmm. by Nick Cave. So fucking cool. Uh, that's not in the fourth one, I think we saw. Yeah, it sucks. We, we didn't catch it, so hopefully it'll make a return. I know that Marco Beltrami is not doing the music 
in mm. Scream 5, but Radio Silence does have the guy who did the music in Ready or Not, which also has a fantastic score. Yeah. So I'm assuming he'll use the themes established. I'm hoping to hear a return of Dewey's theme. Yeah, his little spaghetti western theme. Yeah, that was taken. Uh, I, I forget so. which movie it was taken from, but it was introduced. Is that used at all in the fourth one? I don't know. I know it's it's introduced in the second one. It's not in the first one. Dewey's definitely less goofy in that fourth one. But granted, I think because he's like sheriff, he's sheriff now and he's trying to be more serious. He's got to be serious. Yeah. I think he's, <laughs> it's hard to know say what he's peak goofy at. I think he gets less goofy over time. I think he does too. I think he like, they kind of, ma- he like matures a lot, mm-hmm. but in a way that feels realistic for him. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else to say about that first one? I don't know. We, we could like talk, talk about all... the first movie yeah. ever. It's just so fucking good. Uh, Randy, Jamie Kennedy. I mean, I love Randy. Yeah. You know, Scream obviously is super meta comments on horror movies and not just surface level bullshit. Like they're talking about the town that dreaded sundown yeah. prom night. Like they're, they're doing some good pulls. And uh, I do think when we get to the fourth one, we can talk about if that holds up. But in 96, that was so unusual to have the characters of the movie be so knowledgeable about other movies outside of it. And you know, the more movies I watch that did come up, a bunch starting in the late 80s there were some like ref- but like well scream. even in like there i forget is it friday six that yeah. one of the characters is like oh and you know if you see this type of guy in a horror movie you know For sure it, yeah and i think uh wes craven has has cited friday six as an that influence sense, yeah. and of course his own new nightmare which yeah. was meta on a uh, in a different way yeah because it actually had the actors who had played and it wasn't as funny but uh scream just really made that it's what was it reason de toi or whatever the fuck that yeah, is. Yeah, and I think like in <laughs> terms of like broader pop culture, it solidified like these are horror tropes that like everyone knows. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think before then, because like we mentioned Friday six, there's characters that kind of point out tropey type stuff and it's meta. But I think like broadly pop culture, I don't think because now I feel like if you asked random people like like family feud survey things that happen in horror movies people would say like oh um someone has sex and they die Mm -hmm. you know i feel like maybe before this movie that kind of stuff wasn't as like culturally like in you know in the the uh collective mind of culture absolutely and that i mean it's because scream transcended the horror genre yeah people who didn't watch horror movies watched scream which is so interesting because it's a movie that kind of rests on horror, horror tropes yeah, that's and a so familiarity weird. with the genre. But I think you can enjoy it, even if you've never watched a horror movie, just because enough horror tropes and cliches have made their way into popular culture at large so that you're familiar with them. Yeah. And then you're, you have a character telling you these are the rules of a horror movie. So you just accept it at face value. Like, yeah, okay. and like Scream has enough character and interesting stuff going on besides the meta stuff like even if scream had zero horror movie blatant references in it it's still a very good story Mm -hmm. granted the villains are ones who like watched a bunch of horror movies but they could just say horror you know we were we watched a bunch of scary movies and got it you know they didn't have to like be name dropping specific ones it's still anthony perkins like (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) i don't know yeah scream fucking fantastic yeah Hey, want to talk about our sponsor this week, AMC Network Shudder. Say you're watching Scream and you just can't help but think, man, I wish I had a friend like Randy Meeks. Someone who could always recommend the perfect horror movie for a movie night and really knows his way around the genre. Well, you can't ask Randy for movie recommendations because he's dead. But Shudder is there to be your own personal Randy Meeks. You can stream great thrillers, horror, and suspense for $5.99 a month or $56.99 a year. They have such a fantastic selection. And you know what's great is we had people over for Halloween and James was Dwayne from Basket Case for Halloween. No one knew who he was. And so we were able to just quickly pull up Shudder, put on Basket Case, and traumatize everyone who came to our party. It was great. Everyone had a really fun time. 
Maybe you're looking for something a bit more glamorous and polished than Basket Case, check out the Boulay Brothers Dragular that is new every Tuesday. We've also got a new docu-series, Behind the Monsters, new every Wednesday. If you want to check out Shudder, you can try Shudder free for 30 days. You can go to Shudder.com and use promo code DEADMEAT30. That is Shudder, S-H-U-D-D-E-R, dot com. Use the promo code DEADMEAT30. One more time, Shudder.com. Use the promo code DEADMEAT30. Scream 2. <laughs> Scream goes to college. Yeah. Uh, I think I love you. Oh so my what am God. I so That's the thing is this movie has some deep valleys in it. <laughs> Dude, it does. Like Between when it's... that and that fucking film class um, where they're talking about sequels. The Godfather Part 2. Got it. And then let everybody clap. Yeah. <laughs> Albert Einstein. I feel like the more I watch Scream 2, the lower it moves down in my rankings. Who would want to do that? Sequels suck. The thing is, okay, uh, Scream 2 has a lot that I don't like. It's a messy movie, especially by the end, because they had to keep changing things because uh, leaks were getting out and they wanted to surprise yeah. the audience. So Mickey wasn't supposed to be the killer. And I just realized that, that's why the third movie is there's a bunch of versions yep. of the script. It's literally meta commentary okay. on its own Very film. Good. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I know that, that it makes it even more yeah, enjoyable. Yeah. But uh, so two feels like a mess. But I would also say that two probably has the most moments of interactions between the original characters out of all the sequels. Mm -hmm. uh, and three and four, they get split off more. And granted, three, you know, you got Courtney Cox and Parker Posey. Fucking great pairing. Yeah. But two is the one where... It's you, Dewey and Gale. You get Dewey and Gale. Their first scene together where you find out that, like, they gave it a shot. It didn't work out because she's too ambitious and said mean stuff about his book. Or wait, no. She, she said mean stuff about him in her book. Yes. So that didn't work out. Great. You got Dewey and Sydney sibling relationship, like we talked about. Really happy to see each other. You got Dewey and Randy, that conversation. Oh, yeah. When they're sharing ice cream because Dewey loves ice cream so much. And they're watching Stab like, on the TV with Tori Spelling. It's funny because you realize, like, oh, we hadn't seen this permutation of characters yet. Like him and Randy. Just those two talking one on one. And it, like, it makes sense that the two of them, after surviving Scream 1, would have a kinship. And they both have, like, such a relationship with Sydney. Yeah. They probably feel similarly very protective of her. Well, for different reasons. Exactly. That, that's what I love about Dewey and Sydney. Never, uh, never a hint of romance. No, God, no. It is strictly platonic, and I love it. He, they, they're just probably, looking out for each other. They've probably known each other for like a really long time. If she's really good friends with Taylor, I, I bet. Oh yeah, childhood just friends. Just like oh, my little sister's friend that's always over. Yeah. And like oh, that's just my friend's older brother. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. So those moments between those characters uh, is are always great. So whenever it's a pairing of the original characters, I'm fucking loving it. And also, maybe best new character in Scream 2, Dwayne Martin as Gail's cameraman. Yes. Holy He's shit. He's so funny. I don't he know. He lives. Yeah, he lives and fingers crossed. Please let him come back. Please let him come back. Every line that guy says is gold. He's so fucking funny. And I love that, yeah, he's a character who's smart enough to be like, dude, I just saw Jamie Kennedy die. I am out. It's just so funny because throughout the movie before that, he's like, I don't know if I'm comfortable with this. And Gal's like, no, you're my my cameraman. This is how I treat my cameraman. You will do what I say. And then after Jamie Kennedy gets killed, he's like, no, no. That for is real, fine that out. it's like after a main character. He like knows somehow that that guy was a main character. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. We're done here. So those, those are Scream 2's strengths. I I mean, even uh, her boyfriend, I like his performance. Her, like, ambiguously aged boyfriend. <laughs> I know, he does seem Jerry older. Jerry O'Connell, right? Yes, Jerry O'Connell, that's right. Uh, Timothy Oliphant, we fucking love. I mean, we love Timothy Oliphant, who I, I think they got lucky with him. Like, you mentioned all the script changed a lot, so the the killer was, like, a different person constantly. I think and, it was her roommate at one point. Yeah, yeah. so they... I don't know, like it ends up being him. And I mean, he can shoot some fucking scenery, dude. And that's the thing I love about Scream movies is like that ending monologue is always going to be just chomping mm -hmm. the set dressing, you know? Yeah, just like the the reveal of... Let me explain my evil plans, even if the evil plans in this one are like Mrs. Well, Loomis. <laughs> yeah, you got Laurie Metcalf who like... <laughs> Again, chomping the scenery. It's so funny that you don't realize, maybe you don't realize until the very end that yes, Sydney has never seen this reporter. Mrs. Loomis? Because as soon as she walks on the stage, she's like, Mrs. Loomis? Like she knows, yeah. of course she would know her boyfriend's mom. 
And she's like, Mrs. Loomis? And and then they have this throwaway explanation for why Gail didn't recognize her. She's like, wait, I saw you in pictures. Yeah, like 70 pounds ago. Yeah, and plastic surgery. I think plastic, plastic surgery, surgery something like right, that. It's sure, dumb. Whatever. But yeah, so the reveal, not very satisfying because Mickey disappears after the fucking cafeteria scene, which again is god awful. The bo- yeah, the That's boyfriend. like halfway through the movie, you don't see him again until the very end. Yeah. Not a satisfying reveal at all. Yeah. He's one of the, like, he takes off the mask. You're like, Mickey, maybe? That's, oh, that's Timmy, Timothy Oliphant. Yeah, Mickey, that's, yeah. yeah, yeah. And Mickey, it's revealed that, so, like, we realize that one reporter is Mrs. Loomis. So it's Billy's mom who wants to get revenge on Sydney, and she's partnered up with kid she met online, online on a yeah. serial killer fan forum. <laughs> it's funny, though, like, between that Meeting someone online like that, that's in 97, uh, that's a little bit ahead of its time. And then in Scream 4, Jill's motivation of like wanting insta fame and being an influencer. Yeah, that feels like ahead of its time. That's ahead of its time. Influencer wasn't a term in 2011. It's weird how the like the character that like meeting some person online who's like obsessed with serial killers feels more like that feels like more of a now script than because everyone's like true crime is such a thing yeah that it's like i could see that character being someone who is like i'm obsessed with true crime and i i just want to know if i'd be able to do it like would i be able to do it and not get caught and that's Ooh, you know because i good. listen to some you know i should be i should be able to pull it off and yeah I think all the stuff, uh, once they crash the car, I love the that cop getting impaled through the back of the head. Very good. Possibly the goriest kill of I the also, franchise. We disagreed a little bit on this, but I like the car scene where they're I trying don't. to crawl out the window because it's I, very tense. It is tense, but at the same time, I'm like- Sydney, Just pull that mask off. Just pull that mask yeah. off. Oh, you fell on the horn? Okay, he's still out. Pull it off anyway. Or better yet, take off a jacket, wrap it around his fucking neck and strangle, and yeah. strangle him to death. Like it, it just feels, it feels out of character for Sydney not to take advantage of the fact that Ghostface is passed out. Yeah, in, I instead think that's of like fair. taking active, uh, you know, measures to to stop him, she just crawls away from him, runs halfway down the block, and then decides, and then re- no wait, wait a minute, I'm gonna turn around actually, and then he's gone magically, and then so and then he's somehow behind this building. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, they would have like heard. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's there's things like this that you don't think about in that first one. The last thing I want to talk about from Scream Two is that really long take of uh Randy and Sid where they're just talking about stuff. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot, and I oh. like the fact that he has a British accent right. for like a long time in oh it. Oh my god, Jamie and Kennedy. It's not a lot of shit happens at the movies. People get robbed, shot, maimed, murdered. Multiplex is just a very dangerous place to be these days. Well, what's funny about it is like <laughs> we're watching it and we realize like, wow, this shot's been going on for a while. It's a it's a one. It's a long shot. And it's well choreographed too. They go around a corner, they stop, and then in the background you see Jerry O'Connell hop a banister and run up to yeah, him from so the Yeah, there's a lot of it's moving really cool. parts. Yeah, and that's a hard thing to shoot. It <laughs> might. Theory is like they had shot it so many times that they they do this take and Jamie Kennedy's maybe thinking like we're gonna end up doing this a bajillion more like I don't fucking care anymore and he just does a British accent thinking like this is gonna be a not- yet another take we just fuck up and it happens to be the one they get perfect and they're like well we we can't do anymore we'll just use the one where he did a British accent and it's fine Wes is just like thanks Jamie thank you Jamie that's why I I want to believe that so bad. Yeah. Um, Scream 2 is also like, I mean, all these movies, again, their casts are ridiculous, even in the minor roles. Not Sarah, I'm not talking Sarah Michelle Gellar, who is obviously someone casted because yeah. she was well known and then you kill her, it's a surprise. But Portia de Rossi and yes. Rebecca Gayhart in tiny little roles. Joshua Jackson before he was big in like. Portia de Rossi's so funny in this. Portia, yeah. That's another role where I don't know why I ignored it for so long, but she does She's so hilarious. well. I feel like it, she had to have shown this uh when she auditioned for arrested arrested development, development yeah. because her comedic timing is so good what'd she say i forget she's she... like hi no i really mean that hi that's so funny her delivery so good yeah it's great what well, yeah okay scream two yeah it's it's fine it's fine but i you know our friends that we watched it with said that it was the least fun to watch and i get that because I get it. It, it feels the most copy of the first one yeah. Three and four feel like different movies. Two feels like Scream 1 again in college. Yeah. You know? I agree. 
Scream 3. Scream 3. Hollywood. I know. I know. See, I could technically also be dressed as Parker Posey. <gasps> yes. In Scream 3. You mean the fucking savior of that movie? Parker right. Parker Posey, every time she's on screen, is so fucking funny. Yeah, like her jumping into Patrick Warburton's arm, which feels she's very like improvised baby. to me. <laughs> just and they just kind of kept it. <laughs> so. Oh, man. She has so many fucking good moments where she's, again, someone who can chew the scenery and it works. Yeah. It's like, you're obsessed with her and you're obsessed with her daughter. And then you have Gail there being like, all right, tone it down. So Scream 3 is the most outward comedic. It is a comedy, I would say. Yeah, it's it's extremely goofy it's also the scream movie where the like it's the most instances of like come the fuck on (laughs) oh yeah stuff that just like makes no sense and is so frustrating the fax machine kill destroys me i hate it so much the fax machine kill and oh where he can't read and then all of a sudden read half of the line but then it's too dark for him to finish reading it and he has to light a lighter and then after lighting the lighter he has enough time to read the person who smells the gas and Look up, and, and then, then it ignites. And the gas politely waited to ignite. <laughs> Fuck you. It's, it makes no sense. The that, voice, the, voice changer. the magical voice changer. We anyone, don't have this technology now. Anyone who says that we have it, no. We don't have it as it's depicted in this movie. At, where, Especially back then. Like, fuck off. Especially back then. But to have it in real time... Uh, be able to perfectly imitate someone's voice with a range of emotions. Like it's it's copying Leif Schreiber's voice in the beginning from the other side of a door as right. he's like yelling and then going soft. It's just, no, that yeah. technology doesn't fucking exist. Even just, if it even like beyond the like magic properties of the voice changer, just the fact that, yeah, like someone's in a closet, like the killer's in a closet and they're clearly talking at a, a volume and they you can only hear what's coming out of the voice changer you can't hear the actual person which you would be able to if there's someone in your closet yeah you would be able to hear them Mm -hmm. which it's funny i had that thought in scream 4 but then i remembered like oh yeah he's not in that closet he's in the closet yeah in the other house so i I almost feel like and he you can tell he's being real quiet too yeah so it makes more sense but god this third one just magical voice changer i hate it and he it has like everyone's voices it's got all our voice it's such a lazy fucking shortcut like, of what, like what do you now, mean it's got all our voices like it, what are you talking it's about? so the writer who's not kevin williamson this is the only one he didn't yeah. write until this new one could just like have anyone be like you get a call it could be anyone but oh, it oops it's so ghost face. much yeah i hate it and That's then the whole there's fun of the of Ghost faces, it's the voice. Mm-hmm. Like, ghost face isn't like a shapeshifter. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's Sydney's dead mom hallucination, which just feels out of place. It reminds for me of the second Rob Zombie Halloween. Oh, God, yeah. That's also mommy hallucination. Yeah, it's also dead mom hallucination. And it just, yeah, it, it's just not Scream. Scream is such a grounded, and like we said, this one is definitely the most over the top and comedic, but it, it, it's never supernatural. And I know that these are hallucinations yeah. but there's also it rides the line sometimes it does a little bit of what's real and what's not like what's really there she sees that body bag stand up when she's on set i do like when she's on set of this house and her own house yeah i do like where she's running inside this like fake version of her yeah, yeah. and like repeating the the chase scene but then she'll open a door and almost fall out because it's not a real door yeah like, really i like good that stuff. yeah like that stuff is cool but yeah but like it's like why why now are these starting or becoming a thing for Sydney? Like, why wouldn't they have been a thing in the last movie? It just feels like so random. Well, I think the explanation they give is that she has now isolated herself and that isolation is getting to her. Yeah. She's like lives in the canyons by herself. No one knows where she is except for maybe Dewey. Uh, her phone is, you know, only Dewey and uh, her dad. Yeah. Like, no one knows. So I think that's the explanation. But again, like I said earlier, that's what keeps her out of the movie for the first hour. And that's kind of a drag. Yeah. But, um, you know, I love seeing sets. Uh, I know. I'm such CBS a, like... CBS Radford. Radford. Yeah, CBS Radford. Like, I used to work on that lot. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of cool. I don't know. I mean, that's such Hollywood bullshit. We're just like, well, we like seeing ourselves, though. So this is good. Yeah. That's, <laughs> like, that's the joke every Oscars, right? You, like, make a movie about Hollywood, and we're like, oh, my God. It's the best thing ever. But uh, I the, do love The stuff seeing. with Lance Henriksen is uh, also kind of prescient. I mean, obviously, it existed back then. But right. But well but before it was... 
me too sized right like yeah the fact that that's like a plot line in this mm-hmm. is yeah the the skeezy studio executive taking advantage of young actresses and like mansion part like hollywood mansion parties or you know some fucked up shit goes down granted that's like you know roman polanski had already been a thing and yeah but still it it, it does feel like a it feels like a me too thing before me too especially I mean, you know, one uh, unfortunate fact about the Scream movies is they were made by Miramax, Dimension Films, and the Weinsteins' names are all over them, you know, executive producers, uh, which they had no, I don't think they had much creative input. If you're an executive producer- You're given money. Yeah, like when you're a, a- executive producer of film it's weird how different it is between film and tv like tv if you're an ep you're you, running the show you're running the show like it's you you have like a ton of creative input whereas movies it's more like you put up the money for it and you run the studio that put up the money for it therefore you put your name on it and you can have an influence you can if it. you want but it's like it's more kind of ceremonial almost mm. it's it's a but, weird thing but it's interesting that yeah uh Wes Craven and I forget who wrote this but they they made a movie as basically like about fucking Harvey Weinstein mm-hmm. and put his name on although that fucker probably didn't even see himself in that role I what I think is crazy and it, it is something I I did kind of like about Scream 4 Scream 4 I feel like finally gave Sydney's mom a break <laughs> yeah. Sydney's mom, just as the movies go on, become this like increasingly invisible and tragic character where it's just like, let's just keep adding more fucked up shit that happened to Sydney's mom know, in each yeah. movie. Like this one is is revealed that the reason and this is like a, its own kind of problematic thing mm-hmm. that I think people have written think pieces about, but the fact that we kind of learn that Sydney's mom ends up sleeping around a, a bunch is because she was like raped at this Hollywood party. And it, you know, that the idea that like someone copes with that by becoming very sexually active and stuff yeah. is, you know, it's, it's a lot. Th- that's a lot to unpack. Uh, yeah. I mean, I do think it, the villains are the ones saying like, that's why it happened. Yeah, for sure. Like it, it is the villain being like, you know, that's what, yeah, that's why your mom ended up the way or our mom ended up the way she did um but still it's you know yeah uh roman is the the only soul ghost face yeah solo ghost face. he's the only he did it all himself yeah That's pretty uh, impressive was able to fake his death lying in a ca- casket even though gail checked his pulse yes he somehow has no pulse and listen i know he's a movie director he does not have a lifelike uh, prosthetic of his own body that would fool a person no. up close and personal. That's not a thing. Not yeah. even now. And like, I know technically you can like slow S- down. Squeeze a tennis ball or some shit. It's, it's a thing. Like, I know like it, it's one of those things that like magicians can do like, <laughs> like a, a, not David, Cop- uh, uh, like a David Blaine or like mm. a, you know, but Chris Angel. I feel like that's stuff. That, but like, you didn't have to have her check his pulse. She could just find his body and be like, "Oh shit! Oh shit! Run away!" Same yeah, thing. Yeah. So, like, why did we? I, I, I bet it's just because they were like, "No, people are gonna be so suspicious of the formula at this point. We need to like really make the audience think he's." So dead. we're just gonna fucking lie to their faces, and sure, maybe Gail incorrectly checked his pulse. I shouldn't be having to ask this question. Yeah, it's yeah. Of like, how did that work out? It's it's a problem. Yeah. Uh, we. I don't know if we drove home how much I love the setting of Stu Mocker's house in the, the end of the first one. But I do also like this mansion, this very mansion cool, yeah. with all the, the hidden passageways, which like when you think about it is real gross. Yeah. As the, a kid, I never realized the, like, Oh, the one way mirror, the mirror in, in the, the bedroom. bedroom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fuck. It's so dark. <laughs> uh, Another time where Dewey is very competent when he's shooting out those windows, aiming high. So yeah. Shooting not- at the mirror. So they shatter. Yeah. We do have to talk about how the reveal of Roman like really fucks with the first movie. And I don't like it. Yeah. Uh, it's like big points off this movie for me. I, I like the whole thing. And it's spelled out where, you know, where they work in Jamie Kennedy's return, where it's like the third movie is going to go back to the backstory and we're going to revisit. Mm-hmm. I like that. Where it's like, we're going to learn truths that, yeah, yeah. Where it's like filling in things from the, cause that's what sequels will do. Mm-hmm. And I think that that works. Uh, but I don't like, I could even deal with him being her stepbrother, like magical unknown stepbrother or half brother. I'm sorry. Uh, sure. But 
the reveal that he directed, I'm a director, I direct things, that he was the one who set Billy and Stu in That's motion. That's the thing I hate. It undercuts their whole thing. Yeah. And they they have the best motivation out of all the ghost faces. They're, yes, they have like the most pure, like fucked up motivation. And I hate that Roman is like, I learned this thing about my, like my mom abandoned me and I learned that she had another kid and I got this footage of her having an affair. So I showed that footage to that guy's kid and like knowing it would set him off and he would go on like so he is behind the events of the first movie and i hate it yeah like no i it just, I hate it just it. undercuts him so much and it's it's sad but you like scott foley's uh performance yeah like he's he's doing it up he's doing it up I he's just doing like the whole scott ghost face foley thing in general mm-hmm. i like that dewey finally gets to uh have a hero moment granted uh Sid does have to tell him to aim for the head. Yeah. Because the bulletproof vest, but he mm-hmm. does get to take down the bad guy. So g- props for Dewey. Mm-hmm. Um, he doesn't end the movie stabbed and bleeding. Patrick Dempsey's creepy in this. Oh, dude, he's so fucking creepy. Because I think he's clearly, he is such a red yeah. herring, but then he's like too much of a red herring. Mm-hmm. So that Way later when much. he's like there at their movie night, you're like, ew, who invited this guy? Yeah, he's, he's fucking weird. Like, ew, we don't, it's, our, it's our favorite trio and Patrick Dempsey. <laughs> and here. Patrick Dempsey, who doesn't show up in the fourth. Dude, do they even mention Kincaid in the fir- fourth and one? Dude, not at all. No, that must have been a thing where like they were friends for like a week after screen And they're three. like, they know that people watching that they're not going to remember who the fuck that is. I, I didn't realize until this moment that I like that Kincaid yeah. isn't in. Yeah. Although I do love Kincaid's partner. He's very dry. Not Ben Stiller. Yeah. He just uh-huh. has a few like quips that are really funny. He doesn't die. He kind of disappears. He's great. Mm-hmm. I love him. Uh, yeah. Scream three, man. It's um got a lot of flaws, but I think it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I still don't know if I like it more than two. Well, we'll have to do that at the end. And then there's four came out 11 years later, you know, unlike the first three that all came out within four years total, yeah, which is nuts. Uh, that fourth one was a big time jump mm-hmm. filmed in Ann Arbor where we went oh, to college. Wow. Sorry, we had to like cut because this I needed to take this wig off. I was yeah. getting such I'm sitting here just like I feel like my I feel like my head is like those videos where they put rubber bands around a watermelon. <laughs> That's like what it was starting to feel like. I was like, we need to fix this. <laughs> Oh, wait. Oh, no, you turned it up too high. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, yeah, I think. Nope. Is this? Yeah. They gave us a voice changer. They did give us a voice changer. Hello, Sydney. Hello, Sydney. Surprised. See, but you can still hear both your voices. That's what I mean. Exactly. So even though I'm ghost face, you can still kind of hear James doing it. Yeah. That's how it would fucking sound. Right. You fucking idiots. That'd be crazy if they had our voices in it, though. It's got our voices. It's got both our voices in it. What's your favorite scary movie? <laughs> this is cool. And this is, this looks old. This looks like yeah. What this looks pretty been. legit. Yeah. Um. All right. Let's talk about Scream Four. Scream Four. 2011. 2011. Filmed in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I rode my because I lived on campus that summer. I rode my bike over and watched them film some stuff. I literally think it was the first scene where like they go to school. Like they're they run to the car outside because mm-hmm. it was daytime. And I just remember Hayden, seeing Hayden Panettiere run to a car. Who's fantastic. Kirby. Yeah. Excellent new character. Uh, I Like I said in the beginning, I love checking in on our characters this this much later. Different yeah. stage of their lives. Seeing how they're doing. Seeing Dewey and Gale still together. Yeah, Against all odds. That's great. I love it. I couldn't remember if they were still together in that movie or not. And then the beginning, you see that like they wake it's like they're in bed together i was like oh fuck yeah they're so still there living in woodsboro cuz he's sheriff sydney does not live there but she's visiting on her book tour yes it's the last stop of her book tour mm-hmm. what it's basically just like a memoir kind of thing yeah, yeah. and a successful book as it would be yeah. uh it's the anniversary of the attacks it, i feel like it's always the anniversary <laughs> and the, it's always the anniversary of the attacks well, cuz in the first one's the anniversary of her mom's death right. that they start doing it yeah it's all yeah so, uh, yeah, kicks off new kills in Woodsboro with our faves and then a whole new generation of high schoolers uh, mm-hmm. played by a bunch of people like Emma Hayden Pantier, Roberts. Emma Roberts, uh, a Culkin. There's a Culkin. Yeah, <laughs> I forget who the 
the other actors are the guy with the uh webcam on which uh, uh here's here's our scream movie stupid thing this guy is streaming the non-stop impossible magic webcam yeah that wouldn't have happened in 2011 no you can't just there's no bandwidth for that you can't just stream nonstop on a fucking camera in 2011. Now maybe you could. Yeah, because now there's like 5G and stuff. Like back there's five, And there's like, there's apps to do it. Yeah, right, yeah. Because you'd be using like Twitter's bandwidth if you're using, uh, what's that fucking uh, Periscope. Periscope. Or you'd Jesus. be doing like IG Live. Yeah. And you'd be using Instagram's bandwidth. Dude, Instagram back then was not like, because I remember Instagram started as just filters like all it was yeah. was a program it wasn't even social media it was like here's this cool app that you can put filters on your photos oh yeah and that's what like when that screen was made that's what It'd instagram be would have been that kind of thing <gasps> yeah so weird uh they do mention like twitter in this movie because they're like oh it'd be facebook or no it'd be twitter would be more accurate Twitter, now. yeah instead of here, here's a question how do you feel about the beginning of scream 4 the double fake out ending or the double fake um, out beginning it's fine I don't mind it. I, I guess it's like, it just feel, it feels like a, what else can we do kind of thing? But I do like that it shows a bunch of stab sequels because there would be in that amount of time that has passed. <laughs> and they talk about how like, well, the first three were based on real things and then they just went nuts. I think they say they went time travels in one of them, they oh, said. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> I do love that, you know, the scream or the stab six opening happens and then it's the Kristen Bell Anna Paquin scene. And it's that, weird because that's my least favorite one out of the like opening vignettes. The Kristen Bell and Anna Paquin yeah. one? Yeah. For some reason, I feel like I like the Lucy Hale one is good. And then for some reason, I think it's maybe the dialogue of the Kristen Bell and Anna Paquin one I just don't love. I think it's like it's a lot in it. I don't know. And then that's revealed to be stab seven. And then I love that they call out how that doesn't make any fucking sense that the beginning of stab six would be in stab seven. Wait. Because in Stab 7, they're watching Stab 6. Oh. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, like how would they know? Yeah. yeah. It doesn't make any sense, but they call it out. So That's, it's kind of I funny. didn't even realize that because like I that line just kind of went like in one ear out the other. And I didn't yeah. realize what they were saying. But yeah, that is. That'd be, that'd be like if in Scream 3, they were watching Scream, Scream 2. 2. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's like, wait, what? It'd be weird. I uh, see. Okay. So that whole scene where it's like fake out, fake out. I think uh, can be discussed with Scream 4 as a whole of like, does the meta stuff still work yeah. in 2011 after the novelty's worn off? Because I, I, you know, and now I'm curious to see what they do with Scream 5 because now everything is fucking meta. I'm so, everything I was burned out meta. on meta when this Scream, Scream 4, when yeah. Scream 4 came. Because honestly, like, I, I'm going to get so much shit for this. I, I had fun with Cabin in the Woods the first time I saw it because I didn't know what was going to happen. But then well, every time I rewatched it, I don't like it. Cabin I, in the Woods is great. It's like there's obviously like the effects are insane. Like that shit's cool. I like all the Bradley Whitford stuff, but I just it's like t it's just so bad. <laughs> it gets to a point where I'm like, I know, like you're so fucking clever movie. God. <laughs> <laughs> like congrats I don't but sure you know by 2011 by the time Scream 4 came out uh, I think Cabin in the Woods was out it literally it came, they came out like the exact same time okay I think it but like behind the mask had come out like we had done the meta thing yeah and so uh, it's hard to say if it works as well and uh, again I'm curious to see what they do now because like I don't know what was that show that uh, people kept getting hyped about on Twitter and then we watched the trailer for it and it's just like oh really that meta. one where it was it was an, like adult an animated swim. one yeah it like just came, it was like a two minute like proof of concept adult swim did and i can't remember what like it was all called. the animated world it was like a little corrupted. kid show yeah and everyone on twitter was like oh man this is so good and i watched it we both watched it we were like it looks fine but it's just it's, it's just more it's of that more of the like ready player one the, meta the scene in space jam 2 <laughs> space jam 2 the scene in uh, uh free guy that we watched maybe the dude, rest of that movie's great i dude if the rest of that movie's great based on that scene with like the captain of America, like is that a lightsaber dude <sighs> that line uh, fuck off there's no way the rest maybe of the rest great. of the movie's great hon we can't say because we didn't see it but that scene out of context i felt like i was i was like on dmt like i felt like i was dying <laughs> 
and this was just my brain spitting out like random shit it was just like this is stuff that i know from life and i'm trying to make sense of it as i'm like laying here dying <laughs> kind of like that's how i felt watching that scene <laughs> yeah it's like you know even family guy wasn't a thing when screen the first three screams came out yeah and like Scre- robot family, chicken. It's just the references and everything you know yeah it's it's a different cultural media landscape yeah and referencing things isn't as innovative as yeah, it may it's have like, been that's, before that's a weird thing i mean one of our favorite shows ever is venture brothers and recommending that to people it's it's hard to kind of uh emphasize like how weird that show was in its early seasons yeah where it was like it's so it's referential of things that back then were like obscure like the fact that in venture brothers there's a character based on dr strange where now everyone fucking knows dr strange but back then it was 2003 that's an obscure kind of weird th- character yeah. anyway i don't know i guess i guess the thing i do like about the meta stuff of scream 4 especially is it is cool to see what they are kind of talking about in terms of like it it feels like almost a state of the union of horror like here's what's going on in horror right now and it's all about about torture porn torture porn reboots reboots, Mm -hmm. and so that's a cool thing where it's like oh this was like the where the genre was at although they do have the whole thing where like to survive a horror movie you have to be gay which has never been a case that's never been a rule that is a weird it's It's a weird thing in this movie that it's two lines cut those lines yeah because it's like they say it in the film club and then robbie tries it before he gets killed i'm gay and he gets killed anyway that's not a thing it never has been like the gay character surviving i can't think of a movie where like the yeah and the whole thing with the scream movies is they're commenting on rules that do apply to other horror movies so to just make one up and say yeah this is a thing with horror when it's not when I mean, realistically, it's the other way around, which is what, I mean, Freaky makes that joke. Like, I'm gay, you're black. Oh, yeah, like, we're, we're so, so screwed. screwed. Yeah. I mean, bury your gaze is a trope on TV. Right, trope, exactly. You know? like, exactly. It's, it's the opposite. So that part. Yeah, the out fact that bury your gaze is the name of a trope in this movie is like, it's yeah, easier to survive. to survive. Yeah. It's, like, yeah, I hate that. I hate that. <laughs> it makes no sense. Yeah. Uh, but as a whole, I do like the new characters. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, especially like we said, Hayden Pantier. I love Hayden. Pan- I hope she lived. Uh, Wes Craven wanted her to survive. The last shot we see of her, she is still moving. We never see like a death. Yeah, uh, Nell. She's a good red herring, even though she. I don't think she's ever like really pushed as <laughs> Dude, a red. Our friends were like, "It's her. It's her. It's her. She's good. She's on the killer." <laughs> it was so crazy how insistent they were, and but I I like that she. She seems like maybe she could be. But she's still so likable. Mm-hmm. I um, like her. Jill. <sighs> you. <laughs> I don't like. J- I mean, I her whole like end monologue. There's stuff in it that's really prescient. It like predates influencer culture, which is kind of nuts. Gaining Again, followers like Instagram and fans. Yeah. isn't what it was now. I just think. <laughs> And I'm going to, again, I'm going to get shit for this. I don't think Emma Roberts is a very good actress. I know a lot of people really like her. I know she's in like all the American Horror Stories. I just, I just think for me, like what makes a Scream movie and what I love about the other ones, even if it's dumb as fuck, I love a good villain monologue. And I love, I don't know. She just doesn't have, she doesn't have the charisma that all the other ghost faces have. Like, I kept thinking about how much more I would be into this villain if it was Hayden Panettiere doing that monologue. She's a, such a strong actress. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, Emma Roberts just isn't that. I, I, I will say, though, I like the scene where she just beats the shit out of herself. Dude. It's it's very funny. And that it's it's dark funny, which is good. Great. I love it. You know, she's just kicking the shit out. She's, like, throwing herself through that glass table. <laughs> yeah. And, like, it's so funny and so fucked up. And I do think that it's one of the only times that this movie hits the, like, funny and fucked up thing that I love Yeah, about that's, that's fucking scream. kitchen scene from Yeah, scream. like, that's such scream where it's like, oh, my God, this is so dark, but I'm dying laughing. Yeah, like, driving the knife. Where as, in the wall in yeah the i can't think of many other moments in scream 4 that are like that well scream 4 tones down the comedy from scream 3 and ups the violence it's maybe the goriest 
Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking of their friend. Dude, they're, fr okay. Whose Holy guts are hanging out shit. on their bed. Like, like, after getting thrown through the window and stabbed. All like, the other ghost face would look at, I I'm assuming that kill was it had, Jill. No, because Jill is next door. Oh, that's right. Jill is, oh, so it's, so uh. that's Culkin. Jesus. Okay. He, well, I feel like all the other ghost face would be like, whoa, okay. <laughs> like, holy fuck. Because that room gets painted with blood. Dude, yeah, when Sid gets there, holy fuck. It looks like that cabin in Friday 6. Yeah, when, when for sure. When they there's blood everywhere. There's like intestine. I mean, it, it, it is kind of fun that they talk in this movie about torture porn and like the first death in it, like big death in it, besides like the opening is like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Just really gory. Uh, I, I do like Rory's, uh, I forget his character name, I, Charlie. I do like Charlie's motivation too, you know, oh, that. wanting to be the Randy, but the one who gets the girl. And then he promptly <laughs> gets murdered by Jill. Like, I, I do like those ghost faces. What? Jill and Charlie. I, 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 I want to like them more. I just think I feel, I feel so, I just feel so left wanting by the final monologue. Although I do like where they're interacting with each other and yeah, it, it's, it's interesting that we so in this house there is an early draft of Scream floating around. Do oh, yeah, you have, I have it? it right here, dude. It's signed by signed by Skeet Ulrich. Yeah. We were reading it earlier and oh God, the ending an of draft. this early draft, Randy gets the girl. Yeah. We have Randy the the and very Sydney. final thing is Randy and uh Sydney going off to go to the movies yeah. together. A nice Meg Ryan flick. And I do like that that is changed in for in the first movie. He does not get the girl. And I like that this movie Yet again, the attempt, you know, we have that character getting kind of, <laughs> I don't know. I just think it's a interesting twist on that trope where that character would get the girl, you know, because he deserves that kind of thing. Not, yeah. I mean, like, like the nice John guy Hughes thing. type. Yeah. 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 Um, so I like that uh, boyfriend guy, Trevor. He's a good red Trevor is <laughs> it's such a, yeah. Uh, Trevor is a very like Jerry O'Connell where you're just like, there's this guy who's mm -hmm. just around, you know? Yeah. Like, maybe he's the killer. I hope not, because that would be boring <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> the final showdown takes place at the hospital where apparently no security guards are Holy or no one works. That bugged me a little bit. There's, I, like, gunfire and fucking shock yeah, panels like, and there, screaming. There's so much noise and everyone's yelling, and I just feel like this is the most high-profile shit ever. Someone gets beat down with a bedpan like I they're just, Mr. McMahon. I just feel like some, uh, at least a nurse would come on, come over. And, yeah, all those reporters are outside. Yeah, like you said. Yeah, Emma Roberts. All those like, local Ann Arbor reporters. All of a sudden, Emma Roberts is like, pulse uh, just stops existing. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. she rips, rips off all out. the stuff. Yeah, no one like, comes come to on. check on her. Yeah, put, staging a big thing like that in a very public setting like that. It's tough. And it's it tough. sucks because like, I, I'm very forgiving and, um, when it comes to like logic leaps and I don't know, like, I guess there's a difference between like a leap in logic and like, I don't need everything explained. I guess the police are there. Dewey and Hicks. I guess, but like the hospital staff. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It just, it's not the end of the world. Like I, mm -hmm. do I really care? It doesn't really no. me too much, but it's, it's kind of dumb. I just but kept thinking about it. Stuff that's kind of dumb. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, anything else to talk about with Scream 4? It looks weird. <laughs> oh, my God. What did they do? <laughs> what did they do this movie? What filter did they accidentally control A and paste onto? I was curious. I, I went and looked on Twitter. I searched Scream 4 filter to see if anyone... And like, dude, this is a contentious topic on horror Twitter, apparently, is the contentious way Contentious as in everyone hates it? Um... A lot of people hate it and then some people getting like, I don't get why everyone hates it. And then some people firmly believing that it looks like that because it is mimicking the style of like other horror, mo like other kind of horror sequels. Like mid 2000s, like yeah. horror movies, which I kind it kind of does, but those look like shit. So don't do that. So don't do it. <laughs> there's, there's every time there's like car headlights, it looks like the way that headlights looked after I got my eye surgery done. It's yeah. really bad. Any to look light, at. any street light, it any looks, headlight, any flashlight. It looks light. like when you Google, like, what does it look like to have astigmatism? And there's <laughs> pictures of like street lights where it's all blown it out. It just rings. It's it so like bad. Garbage. That early scene when Sydney goes to the bookstore for her book sign, <laughs> she's like backlit by an open window. Gail walks in and it just. Pfft, it looks like they're oh. coming out of the fucking Cenobite realm. Yeah. Like, it's just blinding white lights. It's so weird. It also, for me, because 
I mean, we both went to school in Ann Arbor. There's something really <laughs> weird about the fact that I'm like so aware that this movie's Ann Arbor, and not California. Like it's Woodsboro. There's a shot before it goes to uh, Stu's house in the first screen when it shows the town shutting down because of its curfew. It does show like a Central Park kind of area that looks a little bit like the where like they shot Plymouth, Screen Four. Yeah. yeah. So it's still weird. It's still weird just because we that's know it. Just, yeah. That's yeah. not a real criticism. That's just me being. It's just me noticing things that I wish I could like. I wish I could turn my brain off for those types of things. It's yeah. just, you know, being familiar with the area. But, but uh, yeah, for all its flaws, still had a fun time watching it. Checking yeah. Checking in with our faves. I guess it's the one where I don't, because it, it couldn't be. It's not the, the like kind of 90s, early 2000s fuzzy. You don't get the nostalgia. Yet, <laughs> no, it's sure. not. And I think the, the filter does um, just hard. It hurts. It Everyone was... looks like it looks. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. bad to look at. Everyone looks very smooth. <laughs> <laughs> but overall, fucking love these movies. Yeah. Can't wait for the fifth one. Let's do a little ranking. <sighs> okay. So obviously the first movies. First. Yeah. 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 But like by far, like I read it. I was Googling. I forget how I and I don't remember who wrote the article, but I saw an article. That someone was arguing that the fourth one is the best one. I was like, let's. <laughs> let's pump the brakes a little bit um, so now it gets hard and yeah now it gets very hard my hmm, I don't know my gut kind of just says one two three four uh, like really yeah I think I will preface this with I think any ranking that has the first one as number one is fine <laughs> Yeah, like I'm not, I don't think I'm ever going to get in like a debate with someone. Over if, which screen Over sequel, which sequels, because I just don't know if I care that They much. all have flaws. Yeah. Uh, dude, get this. I might put Scream 2 last. Wow, interesting. Which then makes the question, what do I put in second? I know, I, I, I was thinking maybe one, three, two, four. Dude. I might be one three four two. One three four two. I might have taken Scream Three, a movie I despised four years ago, <laughs> and put it in second place again. Though you have to remember, relatively, it is one giant gap, and on pretty much an even field with the minorest of gradations going down are the yeah. sequels. They are all pretty much equal to me, but three might have been the most fun to watch. I know I had a fun time watching three. That's the thing. <laughs> Fuck. Three might be my second. I mean, and that feels wrong too because it wasn't written by. Yeah, by Kevin Williamson. Yeah, that seems fucked He's up. He's doing fine. <laughs> but I think three is like the most fun. It's a lot of fun, man. I think I'm going to be one, three, two, four. Okay. I'll do one, three, four, two just because two feels the least fun to me. It feels, yeah. uh, it feels the longest. All these movies are close mm. to two hours. Two is the one that feels like it to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just think four is just not enough fun for me. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't have the vibes. Sure. That I want. All right. Well, that's the Scream franchise as it stands today. This yeah. will this episode will be out of date in two months. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it will be. <laughs> but hopefully you can still enjoy it. Yeah. Hopefully we'll all enjoy Scream 5, a.k.a. Scream. A.k.a. Scream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can't believe we're just in. We're just chilling in this house. We're just yeah. chilling it and it's quiet. Mm-hmm. It's creepy. Like, I it's know. really quiet. No one's cheering over the death of Henry Winkler. Oh, yeah. It's just so fucked up. I know. They're... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the 90s, though. That's like Beavis and Butthead era of like, you know, it's Gen X. Like, they <laughs> hate authority. Yeah. They you know, they're too fucking cool for. Yeah, they don't care. They don't have feelings, you know, like caring about stuff sucks. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks everyone for hanging out in the scream house with yeah us. thanks for hanging out in the scream house we'll have our tour video up and was it january <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that'd be cool i think we're gonna have a little movie night we get to like watch movies on the the tv here it's going we're gonna have our own little randy meeks movie night <laughs> it's gonna be so fun oh yeah there's that scream trivia book do you want to hit me with like, three <gasps> okay, questions yeah, yeah. we just found this they in the left house. yeah they left this on the coffee t- it's scream trivia it's um, it's a very very poorly formatted and written book i don't know where this thing came this, from yeah let me see if i can find any that are like worse. just hit me up with like yeah three questions um because everyone likes it when i get mad at not being able to answer okay nice. sure 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 I know that Randy's last name was one of them, and you saying Randy Meeks made me think of it. That's why. 
What is the first word said in Scream? Hello? Yeah. Okay. That was too easy. It was. Then this question, who does Randy have a crush on? What the fuck? <laughs> oh, this is kind of fun. This is a Scream 4 question. Ooh. Anthony Anderson plays a cocky Woodsboro deputy who is assigned to watch over Sydney while she's in town. What is the name of his character? It's not Hoss because that's uh, the other cop. I can't. I remember that. Hoss is uh, Adam Brody. Anthony Perkins. He's Perkins. Oh, really? I didn't know he. I didn't know that. That's why I read that one. I thought that was Anthony funny. Perkins. He's Anthony Police Perkins. officer. <laughs> Question eight. Stu Mocker is boyfriend of. Okay. <laughs> um, I also like this one. Where did Tatum go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> what? She, the answer is she crawled through that little doggy door. But like the phrasing of that. <laughs> Where did Tatum go wrong? Oh, my God. When Stu and Randy are talking in the video shop about the killer, which movie does Randy help a customer find? Ooh. Is it a horror movie? Uh-huh. Yeah. Fuck, that's a good one. That it's I know that it's a girl who asks him and he directs her and then he's like, Oh, that's in poor taste because he sees Billy talking to And I'll give you a hint. It's one that he says the mom and ET is in. It's not Cujo. Not Cujo. It's not the Hills Have Eyes. No. Come on, D. Wallace. I, f- I forget. The howling. The howling. Yes. Good call. Oh, what name? Does Sydney use when she's volunteering with the women's crisis hotline? Lori? Laura. Laura. You're close. Okay. What is the name of Cotton Weary's talk show? 100% Cotton, 100% baby. Cotton. We didn't even talk about Cotton. Who, by the way, great Oh, yeah, character. we didn't talk enough about Cotton. Cotton's another great, like, complicated, yet ultimately, like, a good guy. Yeah, that he's, character he could saves be Dewey. so much more one-dimensional. But yeah. he's like this guy who was wrongly accused, so you feel bad for him. And then in the second one, you see like he's kind of off kilter about it, and he's really pushy about like using it to you know book talk. Show. He's very fame hungry, yeah. But also like he was in jail for a year, you know. Yeah, he's he's complicated for yeah. sure. Yeah, and then in the yeah third one, you sadly see him get killed. Yeah. Oh, what is what is Sydney's dog's name? In the third one. Uh, yes. Junior? I, no, I don't know. Milton. Milton. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Scream trivia. Are you sure? That can't be right. That's what it says in the scream that trivia. That can't be right because John Milton is Lance Henriksen's character. Oh, wait. Hold on. Let me. I think you saw the wrong answer for the wrong Dude, thing. Dude, I bet I did. Hold on. <laughs> Unless her dog Correct. is. Correct. No, I did look at the wrong <laughs> I'm so tired. <laughs> What's the dog's name? I need to know. Cherokee. Cherokee. Yeah. Okay, that makes more sense than naming her dog after the man who raped her mom. Yep. On that note, merch is back. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, merch is back. Fuck. Uh, what? What's the? I'm gonna. I'll put a link in the description because yeah. I just realized it's not the same link that. Okay. I'm just putting the link in like a little graphic on the screen. It's also in the description. In the future, I'll like read the link. I just don't have it. It's fine. On me. I'm tired. It's fine. I want to go watch a movie. Yeah. All right. Night, everybody. This is okay. so fun. <laughs> this has been the Dead Me Podcast. Stop. No, no, no. Stop. <laughs> Social media. Go. Dead Me James, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. Get it. I'm Carebeck, C-R-E-V-Z-Z on Twitter and Instagram. And that's it. Bye. <laughs> Stop. This has been the Debbie Podcast. <laughs>